Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lower parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. They said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause has this trouble come upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. We'll stop there. If I was to ask the question, as to what is the overriding theme of the book of Jonah, I might well get differing answers. Some may say it's about a prophet's disobedience. Still others might say this morning, it's about Jonah and the great fish. And of course, these are prevalent themes, but they would still fall short of the true meaning of this book. For as G. Campbell Morgan points out, men have focused so much on Jonah and the fish that they feel to see the great kindness of a sovereign God. Brothers and sisters, this is the theme of this book. It's not so much about Jonah and the story of the fish. It's about the kindness of God. Number one, to his servants. Number two, towards sinners. For note what we're told in verse one, if you look at it. We're told, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Notice first that the kindness of God is demonstrated here by the fact that he's prepared to send his messenger with a word to reach out to a people who were entirely undeserving of it. From the very beginning in the book of Genesis, God stated quite clearly that it was with Abraham and his seed that he was going to make his covenant. And of course, Israel were proud of this fact, but one thing they'd rather conveniently forgot is that through that covenant made with their father Abraham, God had promised to bless not just them, but the whole world. Paul goes on in the New Testament to tell us that it was in that seed, as in one Christ, that all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed. And so here, God in sending Jonah to a pagan nation wanted, even in the Old Testament, to demonstrate his kindness, not just towards those who were in covenant with him, but towards those who were not. Please note the depths of God's kindness here in verse 1. We're told that these people weren't just sinners. They were totally corrupt. The vilest of the vile. This is proven in the fact that as was the case with Sodom and Gomorrah, we're told in verse 1 that the wickedness had come up before Almighty God. I wonder, am I speaking to someone here this morning? And You're not a Christian. You're not in covenant with the Lord. I wonder, am I speaking to someone and not only are you not a Christian, but you're like these Ninevites. You're the chief of sinners. Your wickedness has come up before God. Friend, I want to tell you, even though you're not his, and even though you may have 
committed some terrible acts in your life, God in his mercy wants to show you kindness. Would you say amen, church? Amazing things our God will do for you. Note something else here. How God's kindness is demonstrated not by the fact that he calls Jonah, but also that he calls him to warn these people of coming judgment. Verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, because their wickedness has come up before me. Note, God's motive for Jonah was not to affirm them in their sin. He was to cry out against their sin. Would you say amen to that? Brothers and sisters, just to hear Gary speaking this morning, and and I had the same heart coming down in the car. I was burdened all last night. I was burdened because we've got, you know, the American government passing these laws. And yet the church is silent. And do you know what? All of a sudden it's come upon us, hasn't it? In this country, right throughout the UK, right throughout Europe, and even to what was a a godly nation, America. We've got radical Islam swamping us from every corner. And do you know what's alarming to me? There is no voice in the nation. There's a few men crying out against it, and the few that do cry out against it are seen as outcasts. Brothers and sisters, we need to cry it against sin. Would you say amen to that? Do you know what else alarmed me? 38 people on a beach yesterday, gone down, most of them British holiday makers, and still the, the Prime Minister of Great Britain goes on and says, this is not representative Islam. Let's call a spade a spade this morning. Sin is sin, and we need to cry it against it. Sorry for getting excited. We're living in an age of ear-tickling gospel preachers. Don't tell men the truth because they feel it's the kindest thing to do, not to confront them in their sin. And because they don't declare the whole counsel of God, it's the worst thing they could do. Do you know what they're doing today? They're putting a stick and plaster on a death wound. And the prophet put it lovely in the Old Testament. He says, they heal the wound of my people ever so slightly. Put a stick and plaster on a death wound. Do you know what a good preacher does? He gets into the wound and pulls out the, the, the disease. Would you say amen to that? I love what C.H. Spurgeon said. Here's a true watchman. C.H. Spurgeon said, as any good mother does, I give my congregation their medicine. <laughs> Do you ever see your mom and dad? I used to have the pain Britain. Remember pain Britain? It was disgusting. My dad used to say, 10 of us in our family, he says, you know what? You might not like it. Get it down, you son, because it'll do you good. That's what Spurgeon says. My congregation might not want their medicine, but like any good mother, I give them it. You know what he was saying? I declare unto them the whole counsel of God. As Gary was saying this morning, not just the lovey-dovey bits, but the wrath of God as well. And what he meant by this is he declared the whole counsel of God. Friend, God in his kindness has sent me this morning to warn you that there is a judgment coming. And if you persist in your wickedness, if you refuse to turn from him to him, you will not be spared. That was Jonah's task. He was told to go to Nineveh. He was to cry out in their streets against their sins. And it wasn't easy for him. But nonetheless, it was the kindness of God that was leading these people to repentance. But as we go a step further, not only only God's kindness to sinners here, we can also see God's kindness to his servants. If we look at what happened in verse 3, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Twice we're told that Jonah arose to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now, was he fleeing from the presence of the Lord? Well, we know he wasn't, don't we? Because the psalmist said, where can I go from your presence? If I go into the heavens, Lord, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I 
take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there you can find me. Jonah knew that he wasn't rising up to flee from the presence of the Lord. What Jonah was rising up to do was he was fleeing from his duty. Why? Why was he doing this? Well, Jonah knew the truth. and Here's something. He knew that God was a kind God and that he would show mercy to these wicked people if they would turn from their sin. Being a true Israelite and knowing the Ninevites were their arch enemy, truth is, Jonah, the servant of God, didn't want to see them get mercy. He wanted God to bring wrath, and by fleeing from his duty, he knew that they could not receive this message of forgiveness. (laughs) Crazy. Who would employ somebody like this? (laughs) And yet God did. It shows us that God's servants are only men at their best. Would you say amen to that this morning? So what does he do? Well, having been called to Nineveh, he boards a ship to Joppa and heads to a place called Tarshish, which if you look in the Old Testament maps, is in the direct, op- is the exact opposite direction to where Nineveh was. And why was he going to Tarshish? Well, historians tell us that Jonah's own countrymen um, had planted themselves in that place called Tarshish. But note in passing from verse 3, brothers and sisters, the truth is this. When you walk away from the will of God in your life, it's always a downward spiral. Would you say amen to that? Look at verse 3. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the midst of the ship. Pursue the will of God, and it's always an upward ascent. Brothers and sisters, please note God's kindness to his stubborn child. He didn't let him go. He enlisted all the forces of nature to bring Jonah back to where he should have been. Verse 4 says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And there's the kindness of God towards his servant. He sends a storm to crash in upon the boat to bring Jonah to his senses. Are you going through a storm this morning? There's two types of storms. There's what I call the Jesus storm. And we all go through Jesus' storm. That's when you're walking in the will of God. Do you remember Jesus said to his disciples, we're going to go on to the other side. And then a storm hits the boat. They were right in the center of God's will because Jesus had told them to go there. There's a Jesus storm. And we all go through that when we're in God's will. But then there's a Jonah storm. That God will send the winds and the waves when you know you're walking contrary to what he's looking for. And that's where Jonah was. Are you going through a storm? Notice this, brothers and sisters, I want to say this. It's not to break you, it's to make you. Would you say amen to that? Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son that belongs to him. I've been through this many times. I remember one time in my ministry in Hull, I had this attitude on me towards this certain servant of God. And I had it, you know, somebody say, That's, you know, we all feel like that at certain times. I had a real you know, offense as such. And one night in prayer, God the Holy Spirit said to me, you go and speak to him and you tell him. I said, there's no way I'm going. There is no way I'm going. I will embarrass the life in himself. So I turn around, here's me. Do you know how long this went on for? Six months. I was up in the worship team and I was worshiping away. Oh, look at Mr. Spiritual. I was in bits. My prayer life was in bits. I wasn't praying. And I got on my knees and I tried to pray. No way we do. Oh, Lord, you know, pray for this one. And the Lord says, do you remember what I told you to do? Go and do it. No. <laughs> Another couple of months. Many of you know God never gives in. It's just it has to surrender. I finally went to this servant of God and I said, this is how I've been feeling. And he went, Sure, we all get like that. <laughs> and six months I went through this for. If I had just listened to God, then everything would have been all right. But I went through a storm. And I know every one of you can identify with what I'm talking about this morning. God will send winds, he'll send waves until you come to that place of surrender. This is what was happening to Jonah. He sends a storm, but not only that, he sends a fish. <laughs> he sends a fish. Listen to verse 12 and 17 of chapter 1. And he said to them, 
Pick me up. This is Jonah. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this tempest is because of me. Now verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I, I think this is remarkable. Jonah permits these men to throw him overboard. Hey, you ever think about that? Jonah didn't know it was a fish. He was prepared to die. This man is at his lowest ebb. He's thrown into the deep where he surely would have drowned. But God sends provision in the form of a great fish. And perhaps this fish had to come and get the call from hundreds of miles away. Do you ever think about that? Brothers and sisters, what's my point? I know I want to minister to you this morning. There may be some of you in different circumstances, in dire straits, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your school, in your college, with your finances, in your business. I want to tell you something. Do you see if God can prepare a fish in the deep sea and bring it to that same point where he would swallow up his servant to preserve him? Do you not think your God has a thousand ways to answer your prayer? Would you say amen to that? So be encouraged. God knows what you need. And he will bring that provision. Even in the midst of his rebellion, and whilst in great need, God continues to provide for his servant. How did Jonah feel in that fish? I don't have time, but see if you read chapter 2. He talks about from the belly of Sheol, or the, from the depths of Sheol, I cried out unto the Lord. Jonah felt as though he was in hell itself. He said, I felt the earth's bars close in around me. I, I've, he probably heard the, the crashing of the sea as, the, as the, what if it was a fish or a whale came up to, to take some air. He says he cried out unto God for deliverance. And finally, as I was pointing out, as he repents and surrenders by saying that he was willing to do what God originally called him to do, we're told in verse 10 of that chapter, chapter 2, so the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. I'm coming to a close. But we also see as we move into chapter 3, the kindness of God is demonstrated in the fact that he's willing to give his servant a second chance. Verses 1 to 4 of that chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, three days' journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There again is the kindness of God. He spoke to Jonah a second time. Have you failed this week? Have you failed this month, last month? Have you failed in the last year? Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, what's the book of Isaiah say? Isn't it a beautiful verse? I've, I've really clung to it many times. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Amen to that. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Would you say amen to that? Many of you understand this morning, our God's a God of the second chance, and the third chance, and the fourth chance, and the fifth, and sixth, and seventh. Look at David. In the days when the kings go out to battle, what's David doing? Sitting in his palace, relaxing. God had given him freedom from his enemies all around. And so he takes his foot off the pedal, sees a beautiful woman bathing on the roof, stands for her, sleeps with her, another man's wife. Couldn't get any worse than that, surely. No, she gets pregnant. Couldn't get any worse than that. No, he sends for Uriah. Couldn't get any worse than that. No, he sends a letter. He sent Uriah's death warrant and Uriah's own hand to Joab in the front line. And when he gets onto the front line, Joab carries out the orders of David. Uriah dies, and David, for the next couple of years, is a mess. He's a mess. Till the day when God just won't allow him to go on like that anymore. And he sends a Nathan the prophet and says, you're the man. You deserve to die, David. But listen, the Lord has put away your sin. Praise the Lord. He's the God of the second chance this morning. Look at John Mark. 
relative of Barnabas, Barnabas said to Paul, come on, we'll take him with us on the missionary journey. So off young Mark goes with two great servants like Barnabas and Paul. He gets a little bit into the journey and his mommy's boy wants to go back to Jerusalem. <laughs> and he heads on back, leaves Paul and Barnabas. It got so... Uh, Paul must have really took offense at it because this is why Paul and Barnabas ended up falling out in the end. Barnabas says, let's take him again. And Paul says, no, we don't like quitters here. You know, I'm taking uh, Silas with me. And Barnabas says, well, you know what? I believe in the young man. I'm going to take him with me. So they separated. Was that it for John Mark? Because Paul wouldn't take him? No. I love what Paul writes to Timothy. I think it's Timothy. He says in the end, he says, bring Mark with you. This is towards the end of Paul's life because he's profitable to me for the ministry. You know what that tells me? God used this young man. In fact, there's no doubt that God used him because he wrote the gospel of Mark. Amen. What's that telling me? Mommy's boy, God wouldn't give him a chance. God lifted him and used him again. God's the God of the second chance this morning. What about the woman taking an adultery? They threw her at the master's feet. She deserves to die. Jesus said, every one of you is without sin. Go ahead, pick up the stone, cast it at her. They all go away. She's left. She looks up and he says, Woman, where are your accusers? Nobody's left to accuse me, Lord. Jesus said there, I don't accuse you either. But here's the lovely thing. Go and sin no more. The God of the second chance. You know where else it's seen in Peter's life? Peter rebelled against the word of the Lord. Lord, though every man should deny you, not me tonight, Denies him three times. Peter repents with bitter tears. And then the Lord meets him on the Sea of Galilee, restores him again. And the same man that failed him miserably is recommissioned to lead the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2. God is the God of the second chance. Would you say amen this morning? Amen. This was Jonah. No trip to Israel back for Jonah. <laughs> God says, Jonah, get yourself sorted out and do what I told you to do the first time. And why did God do this? And I want you to get this because, again, he wanted to show his kindness towards sinners. He was serious about getting his message to Nineveh in the hope that they would heed the message, turn from their sin, and that he, in turn, could show them mercy. Note here, Jonah finally agrees. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Verse 3 and 4 of chapter 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days journey. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day. Walk and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What was the response to Jonah's message? They believed and repented of their sins. From the very king all the way down to the pauper on the street. The king heard the message. He put on, put off of his robes and put on sackcloth and ashes. He sent word to the city that, that everyone was to fast. Even the animals were to fast. And they repented before God in the hope that God would be merciful. <laughs> you know what I said? You know what I wrote here? This was no half-hearted repentance. This was a full-hearted repentance. Why? Because it was urgent and time was short. What's my point? Brothers and sisters, there's many today who don't repent in such ways because they believe they have all the time in the world. But if sin's wages were paid out immediately, it'd be a very different story. These people knew God's judgment was coming in 40 days. I would like to know how sinners would, re would, would react in this nation if they knew the judgment of God was about to fall in 40 days' time. You would see great repentance then. You know, the reality is this, for someone sitting here this morning, uh, preachers use this as a scare tactic. No, it's not. Tomorrow might be too late for you, sir. Tomorrow might be too late for you, lady. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. They hear the message and they repent. And you know what? There's some people in churches who have been hearing that for years. And still they haven't repented. But God this morning could be talking to you for this, the final time. Stuart, that's just a scare tactic. Heard it all before, is it? I don't know why I've mentioned this from this pulpit before, but I remember preaching in Aubra in East Yorkshire, and I preached the gospel with all that I had that night, and I was meeting people on the way out the door, and there was a man there, um, an elderly man, and, he, and I said to him, Sir, did you have a good night? 
Um, and he says, yes, young man, I was challenged by what you had to say. And I said to him, sir, are you a Christian? And he says, I'm not a Christian. I know I need to get right with God. I said, sir, please don't leave it too late. And he said, I'll consider what you said. Getting up into the pulpit at Living Hope Church in East Yorkshire to bring my sermon that morning, and, and one of our congregation, Mary Yorkovich, comes up to me and says, Stuart, were you preaching in East York, or sorry, Albra, the other night? I says, I was, Mary. Were you talking to an elderly man at the door? I was, Mary. Yeah, he told his family that he was speaking to you. His family have sent a message to you to say that that man on his driveway took a massive heart attack a few days after that meeting was launched out into eternity. Tomorrow is promised to no man. Would you say amen to that? And yet that event that I had an encounter at the well, I preached a gospel message that night, um, Motherwell Football Stadium, and the, the gospel message was, Rejoice, so young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. In other words, live up ple for pleasure. Live for sin. Leave God out of your plans if you must. But the, but the verse finishes by saying, Know that for all these things you choose to do, one day God will surely bring you into judgment. And then the next verse says, Why not remember your Creator in the days of your youth? And I preached that night, and, and out the back were the counselors, and there was 30 people responded to the gospel. Two years later, I found out that a minister's son, who was at that event, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. The young man passed his driving test a short while later and was tragically killed in a car accident. But his daddy sent the message through Lorna Grady, the girl who worked for the BBC, to say, thank you, young man. As Gary was saying, that you declared the whole counsel of God because my son went out into eternity and it was well with his soul. That young man probably thought he was going to live till he was 70, 80. We all do, don't we? But tomorrow is not promised to us. This was the message of Jonah. This is why they repented so quickly because time was short. Note God's response to the repentance. Again, the kindness of God. Verse 10, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. He did not do it. But as we close, we can see God's kindness again demonstrated in the contrast between his attitude, his attitude and Jonah's towards the Ninevites. Listen to verse 4, and I am, I'll be a couple more minutes. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he became angry, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah proclaims the message. He goes out to the east side of Nineveh and he sits down, probably on a mound somewhere, to see what God's about to do. And listen to this. I mean, it gives you hope, doesn't it? Lord, are you, are you going to send revival? Jonah's waiting for the thunderbolt to come from heaven and consume the city. God's looking at this man's attitude. He loves him, but he's going, Jonah, what is the matter with you? You know how God teaches him a lesson? He sends a wee plant. Jonah's getting sunstroke. I got sunstroke yesterday in my baldy dome, so I did. Jo he sends Jonah a plant. And the plant grows up and brings Jonah some shade. Jonah's saying, oh, this is great. The wee plant's giving me some shade from the sun. And then God sends a worm to eat up the plant. And Jonah's raging because the worm came and took his shade. That wee plant was doing no harm. And God said, you can have mercy on that plant. And yet there's what? I don't know how many people in that city who don't know their right hand and their left and you have no mercy for them. As I finish, that's some of God's people today. Would you say amen to that? We're Jonas. I know I am. We get ourselves excited about our plants and our gardens. Not me. Some people do. My wife does. We get ourselves excited about EastEnders. Who loves EastEnders? 
Somebody smile at the back. These senders depresses me, by the way. My mother-in-law puts it on on Christmas Day. Christmas Day is supposed to be a good day. She's sitting watching people taking their lives and all on Christmas Day on these tenders. But the, you know what? They're so worked up about it. We're so worked up about our computers. We're worked up about our jobs. How many have a burden that God would pour out His Spirit for souls? Would you say amen to that? That's this nation. Mentioned about the Prime Minister. Save the planet and abort the babies. Hypocrisy. And it's not right. God's heart, never forget, is for to reach out to the lost. And that's demonstrated by what I talked about with Jonah here. I remember, I have to watch what I'm saying because this goes out on YouTube sometimes. I've seen the other one. But there was a guy, there was a guy in the church that, that, that we were at in Yorkshire. Prominent guy. And John Thompson and I, the pastor that I was ministering with, John and I were, were talking about this. There was these girls, you know, working girls, you know what I'm talking about. They stood outside the, the doors of the church. And there was days when John would have tried to reach out to these girls, you know, and, uh, you know, try to get the men to hear the gospel message and stuff like that. But one of these guys in the church came up to him and went, Pastor, Pastor, um, this, this has to be sorted. We need to do something about this. And John says, you're right. He says, we need to phone the police and get rid of them. This was somebody that was prominent in the church. And you just got to ask yourself, where's the heart for the lost? You know what, brothers and sisters? Let's not have the heart of Jonah. Would you say amen to that? Let's have the heart of Christ. Let's go and seek to show those outside the kindness of the Lord. So that's what this book is all about. It's about not so much a disobedient prophet or a big fish. It's about the kindness of God to the lost. And we can see the gospel preached even in the Old Testament through Jonah. Hopefully you've got something. I went off on a tangent there, Gary, this morning. But hopefully you've got something out of it this morning for yourself. Incidentally, I was, I was playing for Northern Ireland one of these days and uh, and this guy came, comes up to me. It was actually another player. I'll not mention who it was. Because he knew I was really fervent for the gospel. And this prominent Northern Ireland player comes up to me in the corridor. And he says, there's your man who believes everything the Bible says. <laughs> I says, you're right, I do. And he said to me, you actually believe that a fish swallowed Jonah? I said, come here, I want you. I said to him, I'm so convinced that the word of God is true. That if the Bible says that Jonah swallowed the fish. I believe it's the truth. Would you say amen to that? That God's word be true this morning. That will apply to your heart, and I pray that God would bless every one of you. Amen. Let me pray. Father, so, Lord, you get this description of being a God of wrath only in the Old Testament. We can see the kindness of God going and reaching to a people who were sodomites, Lord, in the all sorts. You were still trying to reach them if they would only repent of their sins. Lord, you're the God of grace in the old and the God of grace in the new, and you're still the God of grace today. And your grace extends to, to perhaps someone who's sitting in this church this morning who's not saved. Lord, has been mentioned right from the outset. Thank you that you didn't come to affirm them in their sin, nor did you send Jonah to affirm them in theirs, but you told them, go into that city and cry out against it. And Father, again, we pray that you would give us men to do that these days. Lord, thank you that you're the God of the second chance. Would you say amen, church? Brother or my sister this morning, if you have failed God, he's the God of the second chance. Let him minister to you today. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, we can be like Jonah sometimes, we confess. Sometimes, Lord God, in our own attitudes, we say, well, I don't even want to touch that person. Help us to love people with the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to get the balance these days. But Father, we love you, we worship you, we praise you, and we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would apply it to our hearts for Jesus' name's sake and for his glory.
Amen. Amen.